Well, guys, two weeks ago, uh, again, I, well, I do want to say to Dave and Mary, we love you guys, and uh, yes, and we'll miss you, and, um, and I'm sure we'll see you again, unless the rapture happens, you know, by Wednesday. Uh, we'll see y'all again, I hope, right? Uh, two weeks ago, I, we started looking in Thessalonians uh, under the subject of the model church. And today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're continuing to look at uh, the Apostle Paul, who was the model minister. And we learn a lot from the Apostle Paul and who he was and how he did ministry, because that is the way ministry should be done today. And ministers should be like him. And he, he, wrote to first, he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He said, be imitators of me. So, he, I mean, he just says it. Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. So, imitators, we talked about this last week, means to be a, a copy, to copy him. And we know that the Apostle Paul, this is on your outline, the Apostle Paul performed his ministry and lived his life in such a way that other believers could copy him. That's what he did. Uh, and I want to read verses 1 through 6 again in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 just to remind us about what we talked about last week and what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Paul writes to them, he says, For you yourselves know, brother, and they knew who he was, they knew how he acted, he wasn't some television preacher or some distant person. They knew him. They saw him. And that's what he appeals to them by. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated at Philippi, as you know, you know what we did. You know us. Uh, we had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity, and that word impurity always, when Paul uses it, has to do with sexual impurity. It does not uh, come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts, for we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. And what he means by that is they had the authority, but they did not exert their authority. He could have. So in his ministry, again, this is on your outline, on the notes. Uh, so in his ministry, uh, he did not have error. You see that? He did not have error. He did not have sexual impurity. He did not have uh, deceit. He, he wasn't a people pleaser. He did not flatter people. Uh, he was not greedy. Uh, nor was he power hungry, which he could have exerted his power as an apostle, but he did not do it. That is the picture of a model minister right there. Those, in the negative sense, those are the things that he did not do as a minister. Uh, and everybody in Thessalonica knew it. That's, they knew how he was. Uh, he lived a life always mindful of the fact that people were watching him. And I want to say at this point, and uh, this is kind of something I talked about last week, uh, that is one of the biggest problems in the church today is Christians and Christian ministers and Christians have seemed to have forgotten their God-given responsibility to be a godly example to others and to the world. It seems to me like people have forgotten that, that Christians have forgotten that, that Christian ministers have forgotten 
That they are to be a God-given example to the world. Uh, the reason why we need to be godly examples to each other and to the world is because it brings dishonor to God when we're not. I mean, whether we like it or not, what I do, what I say, how I act, how I behave, how I spend my time and my money and the things that I like, even the things that I like to do, people are watching it. And we are to be examples to this world. And Paul deals with this concept and when he wrote to Titus also, and just by way of introduction um, to the Apostle Paul's model ministry, I want to read how he, he's writing to the church. He's telling the church how they behave, should behave themselves. And he's writing to Titus, another younger pastor, and he tells what exemplary behavior is. And this is what all Christians should be. All Christians. Uh, that's our, this is our model. This is our standard. Now, obviously, it takes time sometimes to get that way in our Christian life. We have to grow. But this is what we should be striving for. He, he, said, he tells Titus, he's writing, he says, Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, Sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. So that, that's the way older men are supposed to be. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands. I mean, you know, us guys, we're so difficult that the, our wives have to be encouraged to love us. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the older women have to come along and say, okay, love him. We know he's a goofball, but love him anyway. Uh, th this is what the older women have to do to encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. And I don't have to tell you there's a lot of women that don't love their children the way they should, and they have to be encouraged to do that. To be sensible, pure. This is talking about the older women uh, teaching the younger women to be sensible, pure. Workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. That means submission to your husband. And he tells us why. He says, so the word of God will not be dishonored. So, so when we live our lives contrary to the word of God, we bring dishonor to, to God's word. That's why we have to be examples. When I go against the Bible, the world looks at that, even other Christians look at that, and it dishonors God. So we have to be examples. It hurts the Bible's reputation. That's what he's saying. In Titus 2.6 he goes on, he says, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. You hear that young? Is there any young men in here? Yeah, Richie's. Oh, come on. Come on. I, I can't tell you how important this is for young men to be sensible. Uh, especially in this world of very little sensibility going on. You know, we've even got drag queens in the Olympics. I mean, how unsent that is ridiculous to do that. It has nothing to do with the Olympics, and now they've messed it up. Just so weird. And you know what? Young men need to be sensible. Um, in all things, show yourself as an example. Do you see that word, example? And really, this applies to all of them: the old men, older men, uh, men, the younger, the older women, the young women, the young men. To show yourselves to be an example of good deeds with purity of doctrine. Now, dignified means uh, you act in a manner worthy of respect. That's what dignified means. 
You act in a way in which people can look at the way you act and respect that. And, and it, it has this idea where you are composed, that you have your body and your feelings under control. Your body and your feelings should be under control. And then he says that you're to be dignified, to be sound. That means wholesome. Sound in speech, which is a beyond reproach. So your life, your speech needs to be beyond reproach. And beyond reproach means that nobody can bring a legitimate charge or complaint against you. That's what beyond reproach or above reproach. They can't bring a legitimate charge against you. Guys, people are going to bring charges against you, right? Uh, but they're not legitimate. You know, the Apostle Paul had all kinds of things that were said about him. They just weren't real. They weren't true. Uh, and that's the way God wants us to behave ourselves. And, and so Paul's laying out standards uh, for believers to behave. This is the way we're supposed to behave. There, it's clear. Isn't that clear? This is not ambiguous. We're not wondering, sitting around wondering, how am I supposed to behave myself? God clearly lays it out for us. So we are to be examples. And we're to live by these standards. And he tells us why in, in Titus 2, 8. Look, he goes on. He says, so that the opponent, which that's everybody who's not a believer, and all of the people that are saying lies about Christianity and our Lord, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. That's what Paul is saying. We are to live this way because that is the way that God wants us to live. And, and we, when we don't do it, what happens is, is our opponents, the world, the people who are not for Christianity, the people are sitting around waiting for us to mess up, our opponents, it gives them a reason to talk bad about Christianity and undermine it. So we need to behave ourselves in such a way that we silence them. They can't say anything bad about us. And here's what I want you to understand. People are watching you. Uh, like it or not, the moment you say you're a Christian, they start watching you. The moment you claim that, because believe me, all of the forces of hell in this world, they hate Jesus Christ. When you say that you are a, a Christian, all eyes come on you immediately. All eyes of this ungodly world system that we live in. And you know, and most people, you know, they feel very uncomfortable with that. Even Christians, they say they don't want to be watched. Want to be watched? That, I could just hear people say that right now. Uh, most people in their life, they don't want to be the standard for people to live by, right? Why don't they want that? Well, because it's hard. That's why. It it is a, a big position to be in. It is a big, important place to put yourself in. And it's difficult, and it's hard, and it means that you can't do whatever you want to do. Now people are watching you, and you have to be an example to them, all, according to all these standards that God has given us. But people don't want to do that. But Paul... The Apostle Paul, he was a true man of God. He was a true Christian. And he took on that role. He took that role on willingly. Because somebody has to, right? Doesn't somebody have to do it? And he took it on. And Christians need somebody, guys. Christmas, the world and Christians desperately need somebody to look to 
to show them how to do things right. How to live their life properly. And the reason why we have to have these examples is because there's many religious leaders out there today. There's many so-called Christians, so-called believers, and religious leaders out there today, and they're leading people astray. And to take it to its end goal, they're leading people to hell. And the sad thing is, is those people don't even know they're going to hell. They actually think that they're going the right way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. So we have to have examples because there's many other bad examples out there. The Bible, Paul says this, he says, brethren, in Philippians 3, he says, brethren, join in following my example. In other words, take on this role. Join in following my example. He, he, he takes on the role of being an example, he, and he's saying, imitate the way I live. And by the way, this is generational. The apostle Paul said, imitate the way I live. And then the people that knew him imitated the way he lived. And then they passed it down to the next generation and the next generation. And right now today, there are people living the way the Apostle Paul lived. He is our example. Now obviously Christ is our ultimate example. But Christ, we are to follow Paul like Paul followed Christ. And it's to be passed down generationally. Now, I do need to say, and I'm not finished with the Philippians 3, 17 and 18, but I do want to say that the Apostle Paul was not a perfect man. He, he never claimed that. He didn't claim to be perfect. But Paul was an imperfect man. This is on your outline. Paul was an imperfect man, a sinner striving to overcome his imperfections. That's what he was striving to do. So but Paul fought against his sin. You know, most people just give into it, right? Most people just, oh, it's a sin, I'll just give into it. I don't I feel like doing this. I want to do this. I like this. This is fun. I'm just going to do it. Feels good, right? I'm just going to do it. Paul didn't do that. He fought against his sin. He fought against it. And Paul is saying, follow me in that. Follow me in that. Christ fought against sin. Of course, he won, right? He didn't sin. Jesus never sinned. But he fought against sin and defeated it for us. And Paul wanted to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all he wanted to do. He wanted to obey the Lord he wanted to be as much like Jesus Christ as he possibly could be in this life. And he says to other believers, look what he said. He says, pursue me in that. Pursue that with me, should I say. Join me in that kind of pursuit to fight against sin. In Philippians 3, 17 and 18, he says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So there's other people that were catching on to the example that the Apostle Paul was using. And uh, so he's telling other people, just, and follow them. Look and see who are, are being like Jesus, being like the Apostle Paul, and you follow those guys too. And then he tells us why we need to follow him. He says, for many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And guys, false teachers always bring sadness to the heart of a true minister of God. They, it always does. And that's why Paul's weeping. Because he understands what those false teachers are actually doing to people. They're destroying their life. I mean, you can't live the Christian life unless you, you have the truth. And there's so much stuff out there 
And Paul describes it. He says they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And really that's just another way of saying they are enemies of salvation. They do not teach the gospel message properly and they are not good examples. And they have error. They have sexual impurities which the apostle Paul did not have. They, ha they are deceitful. They are people pleasers. They are flattery. They have greed and they're power hungry. And they do all this in the name of Jesus Christ. They do all this in the name of Christianity. Matter of fact, they probably use tons and tons of Christian words, and they don't mean any of them. But there's a vast amount of people out there that believe them. So Paul lays out what a model minister is. And he says, follow my example, don't follow theirs. And last week, we talked about this. You remember the Apostle Paul, he is being attacked by false teachers, false Christians, and they are actually saying that he is the fake minister, that he is a liar. That's what they're saying about the Apostle Paul. So he has to defend his ministry, and he doesn't want to do that, but he has to. You know, who wants to have to stand up and defend yourself? You know, it's like, why are you even saying this to me? But you have to defend yourself. Why? Because he's defending truth. And he is defending Christ. So what we started seeing last week, that in this model ministry, the Apostle Paul, there's four characteristics that... I want to give you out of this model ministry. And the first one last week we looked at that he had God given boldness in his preaching. Guys, it's not easy to preach the word of God. The true word of God. It's easy to water it down. But he had boldness in his preaching. It says here, um, but after that, but after we had suffered and been mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we, were, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. And we talked about that last week. In other words, he, he, suffering did not stop him from preaching the word of God. But the second characteristic is, in, is that there was purity in his message. There was purity in his message. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, for our exhortation, and exhortation just means his appeal to believe the gospel. He was exhorting people, encouraging people to believe. He says our exhortation does not come from error or from impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we, just, uh, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. So Paul is saying about himself as a minister and his associates. He uses the word we. He's talking about Silas and Timothy. We have been approved by God for ministry. In other words, Paul did not call himself into ministry. Right? He didn't call himself. You know, there's some, some people are called into the ministry by their mama or their parents or maybe even somebody else. They want them to be a minister so bad they tell them they're a minister. And you can't be called into ministry by anybody but God. He is the only one that called the Apostle Paul into ministry. And Paul didn't make up the message that he had. God made up. God gave the message. Paul didn't make anything up. It was inspired by God. So Paul is asserting that his message of the gospel came from God and and. He is saying that God entrusted me and my companions and other people with the gospel message. And the message was from God. It's good, by the way, the gospel is good news to people who believe it. But it's very, very, very bad news to people who don't believe it. And Paul describes his message in verse 3, and he does it in three ways, three things. First of all, there was no error. There was no error in it. Uh, in other words, uh, there was no false teaching in his message. It was 100% true. Uh, the message 
There was 100% truth and the message was true. Unlike the Book of Mormon or uh, what's the Bible translation of Jehovah Witness? Um, Y'all know the New World translation where they say that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was a God. It doesn't say the God. It was God. Definite. It says a God because they believe there's many gods. The Book of Mormon. You know, you know what Mormons believe, guys? Mormons believe that they're going to become a God. Did y'all know that? Did you also know that the writer of The Chosen is a Mormon? Did you know that? Yeah. And the yeah, so I mean you got to understand these kind of things. There's all kinds of false teaching interwoven in that series because it has Mormon influence. But most people don't know that. So this is these are false teachers. There's error in it. And believe me, it's hard to see sometimes. Paul saying, my message was 100% true, without error. And there's no impurity in his message. Now, that word specifically refers to sexual impurities. It always does in Paul's writings. Um, Paul's enemies were accusing him of doing what they did. You know, all, all false teachers, I mean, all you have to do is kind of look around and watch the news and kind of let your memory think about it. All the false teachers, even in our day, they've always fallen in some kind of sexual sin. Because look, doctrine always affects your behavior. Always does. If you don't have the right doctrine, you're not going to live your life properly. Uh, you have to live a pure life, a sexually pure life. And all false teachers... Uh, you can just trace it back. They usually fall into something like that. So they're accusing the Apostle Paul of doing what they did or what they do, these charlatans and religious peddlers of his day. And they were saying Paul was using his ministry in order to get converts so he could get sexual favors. That's what he's saying. You know, you know, and people do that. I know it's hard for this group here to understand and believe because that's not a world you put yourself into, but that is the religious world out there. And there's example after example after example. And the other, the false teachers that um, have not been caught yet, just wait. Give it time. They will. Just give it time. Some of them are slicker than others and can get away with it for a long time. But eventually it comes out that they are um, living a false life. Now, there are those who use their spiritual position to manipulate people into impure action. So Paul is defending himself against this, and he's saying, that's not me. I don't do that. I'm pure. And then there was no deceit in his message, no deceit. Now, deceit has the idea of a bait where you're trying to entrap someone uh, without them realizing that it's happening. You know, like a fish and a worm and a hook, and the fish is swimming along, it sees the worm, it's trapped. It didn't realize it was even happening. But now they're caught. Paul is saying that I don't have trickery in my ministry. Uh, Paul didn't use Christian salesmanship and he didn't use clever presentations to get people to follow him. By the way, the churches in our world today is packed full of that. Matter of fact, that's why the churches are packed full. It's because those false ministers and those fake pastors who are doing things behind the scenes that would make you blush are also very clever in the way they get people to follow them. And Paul said, I, I'm not like that. I'm a man of God. And there's no deceit um, 
You know, there's some pastors who, who believe that it really doesn't matter what you do, just get people in the church. There's a name for that. It's pragmatism, by the way. Y'all know what pragmatism is, right? If it works, do it. It doesn't matter if it's moral. It doesn't matter if it's right. It doesn't matter if it has integrity. It's just whatever it takes, get them in the building. As long as you can get them in. If you have to entertain them, if you have to wow them, if you have to feed them, if you have to flatter them, it doesn't really matter what you do, just get them in the building. And the problem with that is what happens when people do that is they attract people who might be followers of them, followers of that church, but they're not followers of Christ. They're not born again. They're in a church, and they, if you ask them, where do you go to church? They'll proudly tell you where they go to church. But you just observe their life for a while, and you can tell there's no fruit in their life. There's no fruit of the Spirit in their life. They're not followers of Christ. They're followers of that church. They're followers of that personality. <clears throat> you know, in order to get people to follow Christ, you have to tell them the true gospel. Not a watered-down version of it. And that's deceit. And that's what people are doing. This is what Paul is talking about here. By the way, there's 27 letters in the New Testament. 26 of them are packed full of rebukes to false teachers. All through those books. It is really one of the main subjects of the Bible. is telling us to avoid false teachers. And yet, some Christians act like there are none. It's like, act like there are no false teachers. Guys, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they're, they have very clever presentations. They're great salesmen. They work every angle to get you in their church, to get you in that building. But Paul wasn't like that. There was purity in his message. There was clear intention in his heart. Point number three, he says here, but just as we, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. So pleasing God was Paul's clear intention. That was his goal. And guys, when the gospel is preached without trickery and when it's preached with half-truths, and when it's preached with salesmanship techniques, I mean, people can take that a little bit. They can take that. Uh, or when I should say when it's pricked, preached with trickery and half-truths and salesmanship, they can take that, they can kind of listen to that preacher. But when it's preached without that, trickery and half-truths and watered-down the sinful flesh of man, they don't like that. It's, it's not pleasing to hear that to the sinful flesh. But Paul was a minister, and, and he says, I've been entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. So Paul's clear intention of his heart was to please God. That's all he really cared about, was pleasing God. And that's what his motivation was to preach the gospel. He got up every day thinking, how am I going to please God? It, chapter 2, verse 4 says, Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. So here's the thing. Paul understood that there's an all-seeing, all-knowing God. Do you all know that? Did you know there's an all-seeing, all-knowing God? And... He examines your heart. Do you know that? Well, Paul understood that. And see, Paul, that's all he cared about. That was his motivation. He, he cared about God. He knew that God was looking into his heart. He knew that God knew everything he did, everything he said, all his thoughts, what was in his heart. Paul knew that. And, and all he wanted to do was for God to look into his heart and see, Paul wants to please me. 
Now, he may not do every, Paul may not do everything perfect. You're not going to do everything perfect. I'm not going to do everything perfect, perfect. But God can tell if our heart is, is wanting to please him. He know, God knows the difference between somebody who's in it for themselves and who's in it for God. He knows the difference. And when that's what Paul wanted, and, and see, Jesus, Paul always remembered who Jesus was. Jesus was the one who saved his soul from hell. He saved him. And Paul wasn't in it for the men. Paul was not in ministry for the money. He certainly wasn't in it for the sex. Paul even stayed. He, he did not marry because he wanted to devote his entire life to the Lord. He wasn't in it for power. He wasn't in it for popularity. Uh, Philippians 1.21 tells us Paul's heart. He said, for me to live is Christ. So as long as I'm here on the earth, my, my motivation is to please Christ. For me to live as Christ. And then he says, and to die, hey, that's gain. That's a plus. Because then I can be with Christ forever. So he had the concept that I, as long as I'm pleasing God, that's all I want. And the point of his life, and guys, I want you to get this. Write this down, or I think it's on your notes. The point of his life was to live in the constant presence of God and be found faithful. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted to live constantly. I am always in the presence of God and I always want God to find me faithful in whatever I'm doing. Even what I'm thinking. And guys, that's the point of his life, and it's really a pretty good point of the Christian life for you and me, is to live our life like that, to understand we're always in the constant presence of God, and we always want to be found faithful. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 and 5, he goes on, the Apostle Paul, and he says, So we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart, for we never came with flattering speech. Flattering speech. You know, and flattery really is when people are talking to you and they're really, they're really trying hard to please you. You always should be suspicious of people who are too flattering. When they're, they're over-pleasing to you. And that's the way some of these preachers do. Some preachers, they won't even say anything about you're a sinner you could go to hell if you don't repent. They never say those kind of things. They don't call out sin. And they, they try their best not to do that. They're very good at it, by the way. I've watched them. Like, how did you just say that and not be offensive? But they're, they're masters at it. Um... But Paul said we don't use flattering speech. Warren Wiersbe wrote, in his book, he said, a flatterer is one who manipulates rather than communicates. <laughs> First Thessalonians 2.5 says, for we never came to you with flattery speech, as you know. And Paul's telling them, you know we didn't do it. We, you know we didn't flatter you. We preach the truth. And let it fall where it may. Nor with a pretext. He said we didn't come to you with a pretext. A pretext is when it's, it's like a cloak of uh, where you're trying to hide your true intentions. That's a pretext. It's when you never tell people the real reason why you're doing what you're doing. You have a reason but you're not telling them the real reason. And we didn't come to you for a pretext. For greed. Look what he says. For greed. So Paul, Paul wasn't greedy for their money. But you got guys, false teachers are. Matter of fact, that's one of their main driving um, aspects of life. Is false teachers, um, as I said earlier, they're always working the angles. They'll, they'll do anything to get the building feel, full 
Because what they know is, is that those people come, and some, some of those people are genuinely wanting to have a relationship with God. They don't know you're a false teacher, so they give all kinds of money. And that's what the false teachers want. They'll flatter you. They'll do anything. They'll put on a show, whatever they have to do. They'll act. They'll jump up and down all over the stage to get, get your attention. So you could say, wow, that guy's really on fire for God. No, he's on fire for your money is what he's on fire for. That's what he, And they will do anything, they will say anything they have to say to get what they wanted from people. And that's still going on today. Because they don't only like sex, which they do. I don't want to go too far into that, but I could just start naming famous preachers. One just recently that everybody has loved for years. I've always been suspicious because I think his doctrine's wrong. But now he's fallen. He had to step away from his church. It just happened 50 years too late. But the Apostle Paul wasn't like that. But these people, they, they don't only want sex. They like money. They like nice things. They like luxury. They will please you. They will flatter you. They will deceive you to get your money and get what they want. Some of them want power. They want popularity. They value those things, of course. And Paul says, we're not like that. And he calls upon God. He says, God is witness. God is my witness that I'm not like that. God knows that Paul was bold, that he was pure, that his intentions were to please God. Paul knew that. Uh, God knew that about him. And the fourth thing is there was humility in his ministry. There was humility in his ministry. He says, nor did we seek glory from men. You know, and the false teachers, that's what they were accusing the Apostle Paul of. They were accusing him of trying to seek glory from people. And they're saying that Paul's in it for the attention. Paul's in it for the praise. Because Paul did have a ministry in which people were saved. And people were appreciative that they got saved. <laughs> that their life was changed. That their life was transformed. They were very appreciative of that. And they looked at Paul and said, thank you for that. You know, being a part of that. And these false teachers were accusing him of... Uh, Loving just the praise and the intention. And of course Paul's saying, no we weren't. Nor, he says, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. So he's saying, we have never wanted you to put us on a pedestal. That's what he's saying. Though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. See, Paul didn't want them to put him on a pedestal. But you know what? He deserved it. He, deserved, he had the authority. He was the apostle of God. And he could have exerted that authority over them as the apostle. But he didn't do it. He didn't do that. And, and you know, why? Why didn't he do that? Well, here's why. Because he was a real minister. Real ministers don't do that. They don't expect to be put on a pedestal. Uh, they're servants. That's what they are. And true slaves, and again, the Greek word is doulos in the Bible. It's, trans it's mistranslated by many of the translations of our day, and they translate it servant. And it really should be translated bond, slave, or just slave. Servant's a lesser term. It's not as strong. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. We're servants also, but we're slaves. And this, is, this truth is laid out in this passage that I want to read to you. But true slaves in Christ don't see themselves in an elevated position. They just don't see that. They, they never think, they don't think that way. That, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in a 
elevated position. Uh, they see themselves as lowly, humble servants. They're willing to serve, and they don't expect any praise from people. They don't expect it. And I'm only, I'm only going to read one more scripture, and we'll close. Uh, this next scripture, I believe the Apostle Paul knew about that Jesus had said to the other apostles where he was telling them how to lead humbly, to have a humble ministry. This is what Jesus said to the other apostles. The Bible says, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. So they, the, you know, the lost people, they just, I'm the boss and you better know it. They lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. You know, they tell them what to do constantly and are bossy. Verse 26. It is not this way among you. So you're not to do the church like the world does. We're not like the world. He said, it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So there's the Christian model right there. Um, we're servants, we're slaves. Now, Jesus did something that we can't do. We can't give our life a ransom for people. We can't do that. Um, that wouldn't get you anywhere. <laughs> Nobody wants me, you know. Uh, but Jesus gave his life a ransom. And what that means is, is that he paid the price to deliver you from being captivated and captured by sin. He paid the price. And he paid the ransom for you. Now, I can't do that for you, and you can't do that for anybody either. But what I can do is I can be a servant to you. And I can be a slave. And I can give my life for other people. I can do that. I can be a servant. I can be a slave. I can give, give of myself to people. And that's what Paul did. That was the model. That was the model minister. And people knew him. They knew him. You know, people need to know their pastor. They need to know their minister. They need to be able to walk up and talk to him and find out what kind of person is he. And one of the big things about false teachers is they're isolated. They isolate themselves to where there's only a small group of people that can even get to them. And um, those people are in on it too. But this is the model. And if you want to know what a true minister looks like, you look at that. That's what you look at. And God gave him boldness to preach the gospel. He gave him purity in his message. He gave him clear intentions that he was his intention in his life was to please God and that there was humility in his ministry. He didn't care about being elevated and praised by people. Now, people did that for Paul, I think. I think that they respected him and cared deeply for his ministry toward them. But, and they should have done that for him. But Paul didn't require that. He was humble in his ministry. And I hope and pray that this message helps you see what a minister ought to be like. Because if they're not, you know, there's two kinds of preachers, two kinds of ministers. There's one that preaches the Bible and lives according to this. And then there's the one that ought to resign. They need to resign. If they don't change, which we hope they do, right? We hope people change. And, and we don't want people to quit their churches and resign. <laughs> you know, 
we want them to be live their life the way the Bible teaches to live their life. So I hope and pray this message has helped you today. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this model of ministry that the Apostle Paul gave to us so clearly. It's sad sometimes that the fact that he had to defend himself to people. Uh, people were accusing him of things that he was not guilty of. They were twisting his words, lying about him. So he had to defend himself. But we're thankful that we have it written here so we can read it. Father, we pray that you would help us to have discernment so we will not follow or be, in draw, be drawn toward false teachers. There's so many of them. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Help us to know the difference between ones that are true men of God, true ministers, who live their life as an example for others, and those that are in it for what they can get out of other people. And Father, if there's somebody here today that they've never trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, we're just so thankful that, that we know that you paid the ransom for sin. I don't have to pay for my own sin. You already paid for it. You have delivered me out of the bondage of sin and the punishment of sin in hell. And that was a gracious gift that you give freely to anyone who believes. To anyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that someone would do that today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.